Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Rick Miranda. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice President here at Colorado State, and I want to extend a warm welcome to a filled theater tonight for a, what promises to be a very engaging presentation. Um, this is uh, part of what we're calling the Provost's Ethics Colloquium Series. And uh, I just want to say a little bit about the history of the, the, the thing, and it doesn't have much of a history, so this will be short. Uh, I sort of see about four roots of uh, why we came to start doing this. First of all, last five years or so, we've really tried to upgrade our efforts in the responsible conduct of research here at CSU, and that has led us to think in a whole um, sector of activity at, on campus about ethical issues related to, to research matters. Coupled with that, there is an emerging awareness across campus that ethics issues may need to be expressed a little more deeply in our curriculum, and a little more purposefully. And we're not quite sure where we're going with that, but we're, we may look to our core curriculum to uh, provide some of that. We may look to uh, disciplinary degrees to help us do that but more to come on that in the next year or so. And third, there's just a lot of grassroots activity in many departments across campus with really some spikes of excellence in, in uh, the area of ethics. I might mention our, our, our world-renowned work on animal rights, for example, the Daniel Center in Business Ethics. Uh, environmental ethics is very, very strong in this campus. We have some really great, great things going on uh, across campus. And finally, you know, my, my own deepening interest in these matters and, and what I perceive as broader campus needs in these directions. And for the past, past few years, I've been a member of the American Mathematical Society Committee on Professional Ethics, and many interesting issues in my home discipline of mathematics has arisen, and I've gotten exposed to that, and I've gotten more and more interested. Regular conversations with faculty from many disciplines across campus are always an eye-opener for me. You know, I'm, every once in a while I'll, I'll meet faculty members and when it seems appropriate, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of play dumb, which is, comes very naturally to me. And I be, uh, they always, um, I always ask, you know, what about, what, what are all the eth ethical issues that are related to your own discipline and in your department or in your research? And, and I always are, am fascinated by the breadth of things that come back to me when I, when I uh, engage in those conversations. It's clearly, I've become more convinced than ever and really more impressed as well that our faculty see ethical dimensions in their own disciplines and more broadly in a very acute way. So this series, uh, uh, Ethics Colloquium Series, has been active for a year or two and to be honest, it's been primarily sponsoring or assisting with uh, already planned departmental and college events. And I really want to uh, thank uh, Gwen Gorzelski, our executive director of the Institute for Learning and Teaching, a professor in our English department, but also uh, very active members of a committee that helps her. And here tonight is Moti Gorin, Lumina Albert, Matt Hickey, and I want to mention especially Barb Hauser from Tilt who has helped out uh, very well to put, put uh, this event on. Today is our first major event that's sponsored by the series itself and not sort of co-sponsored with another department. We're delighted at the prospect of hearing from Professor Nussbaum today and at the interest of our campus in listening to her talks. We filled the, filled the theater twice today. Her work on ethics has influenced her colleagues who are involved in public discourse about a variety of topics of vital interest related to many of the challenges that we face today as a civic society. And it's an honor to have her here with us today. Now I want to introduce our Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Ben Withers, who will give a proper introduction to Professor Nussbaum. Good evening. As Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, it's my special pleasure to introduce Martha C. Nussbaum, the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics at the University of Chicago. It's my pleasure, one, because of the impact that her work has had on my thinking as Dean and as a humanist, and also because of the College of Liberal Arts would be, now that she's visited us and has been seduced by our beauty and the quality of our work, her tenure home. 
She received her bachelor's degree from New York University and her master's and PhD from Harvard. Prior to appointments in the law school and philosophy department at the University of Chicago, which we all know is really the center of all, all scholarship, she taught at those lesser lights, Harvard, Brown, and Oxford universities. She is the author of numerous articles, the editor of some 21 volumes, and has contributed books of impact and tremendous scholarly range, beginning in 1986 with Fragility of Goodness, Luck and Ethics in Greek Tragedy and Philosophy, and my personal favorite, Cultivating Humanity, published in 1997, and also including Anger and Forgiveness in 2016. It seems like she publishes a book a year, so this year her contribution is a newly punished, uh, published monograph called Aging Thoroughly, Conversations About Retirement, Romance, Wrinkles, and Regret, which is co-authored with Saul Levmore. This will soon be joined by a forthcoming book, The Monarchy of Fear, A Philosopher Looks at Our Political Crisis, which is due sometime next year. Over the course of her distinguished career, she has received honorary degrees from 56 colleges and universities in the United States, Canada, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. In addition, she has won numerous national and international awards, including in 2010, the Centennial Medal of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University. And in 2016, her contributions to art and philosophy were recognized through the Kyoto Prize, acknowledged as the most prestigious award available in fields that are not traditionally honored by the Nobel. Most recently, she was named the 2017 Jefferson Lecture in Humanities, and I'm sure many of you know that this is the highest honor that the United States federal government confers <clears throat> for distinguished intellectual achievement in humanistic disciplines. In connection with that award, she was recently interviewed in Humanities Magazine, and she shared these thoughts. Quote, my whole career is about the search for the conditions of human flourishing and asking, what are the catastrophes that can get in the way? What are the ways in which we'll, we are vulnerable? Of course, as human beings, we ought to be vulnerable. We shouldn't try to say that we can be self-sufficient or do everything that's necessary for a good life on our own because we need other people, unquote. In our common need to gather together to share and to learn, we are honored tonight to welcome a scholar of such impact, brilliance, and insight to address the subject of her talk, Anger, Powerlessness, and the Politics of Blame. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, once again, I don't know how many of the people are the same people as heard the other talk, so I'll just say it's really a great pleasure to be here. And I'm very happy to be part of the ethics initiative because I, I, I do really believe that philosophy plays a central role in that. And so let's hope that this talk will contribute to, to philosophy making its contribution to that. Uh, although I will also include, and you'll see I'll begin with literature. So I'll start with the Greek tragedy, in fact, which harks back in a way to my, not, not my first book, but actually my second book, The Fragility of Goodness. Um, so the Oresteia of Aeschylus, a great drama about justice and anger. At the end of Aeschylus's Oresteia, two transformations take place in the city of Athens. One is famous and the other often neglected. In the famous transformation, the goddess Athena introduces legal institutions to replace and terminate the cycle of blood vengeance, setting up a court of law with established procedures of evidence and argument, and a jury selected by lot from all the citizen body of Athens. She announces that blood guilt will now be settled by law rather than by the furies, ancient goddesses of revenge. But, the Furies are not simply dismissed. Instead, Athena persuades them to join the city, giving them a place of honor beneath the earth in recognition of their importance for the health of the city. Now, typically, this move of Athena's is taken to be a recognition that any legal system must incorporate and honor the retributive passions. 
These passions themselves remain unchanged. They simply have a new house built around them. So the Furies agree to accept the constraints of law, but they retain an unchanged nature, dark and vindictive. That reading, however, ignores the second transformation, a transformation in the character of the Furies themselves. As the drama begins, the Furies are described as repulsive and horrifying. They're said to be black, disgusting, their eyes drip a hideous liquid. Apollo even says they're vomiting up clots of blood that they've ingested from their prey. They belong, he says, in some barbarian tyranny where cruelty reigns. Nor when they awaken do the Furies give the lie to these grim descriptions. As Clytemnestra's ghost calls them, they don't even speak. They simply moan and whine, making animal noises. When they do begin to speak, their only words at first are, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, as close to a predator's hunting cry as the genre allows. As Clytemnestra says, in your dream you pursue your prey and you bark like a hunting dog, hot on the trail of blood. If the Furies are later given poetic speech as the genre demands, we're never to forget that initial characterization. What Aeschylus is doing here is to depict unbridled resentment. It is obsessive, destructive, existing only to inflict pain and ill. As the 18th century philosopher Bishop Butler observes, no other principle or passion hath for its end the misery of our fellow creatures. So Apollo's idea is that this rabid breed belongs somewhere else, surely not in a law-abiding democracy. Unchanged, then, these furies could not be at the foundation of a legal system in a society committed to the rule of law. You don't put wild dogs in a cage and come out with justice. But the furies do not make the transition to democracy unchanged until quite late in the drama, they're still their bestial selves threatening to disgorge their venom on the land. But then, Athena persuades them to alter themselves so as to join her enterprise. Lull to repose the bitter force of your black wave of anger, she tells them. But of course that means a virtual change of identity. So bound up are they with anger's obsessive force. She offers them incentives to join the city, a place of honor, reverence from the citizens, but only if they adopt a new range of sentiments, substituting future-directed benevolence for retribution. Perhaps most fundamental of all, they must, as it were, become philosophers. They must listen to the voice of persuasion. They accept her offer and express themselves with gentle-tempered intent. Each, they declare, should give generously to each in what they call a mindset of common love. Not surprisingly, they're transformed physically in related ways. They apparently stand up, assume an erect posture for the procession that concludes the drama, and they are given crimson robes from citizens who are their escorts. So they become Athenians rather than beasts. Their very name is changed. They're now the kindly ones, the humanities, not the furies. Now this second transformation is just as significant as the first one and indeed crucial to the success of the first one. Aeschylus shows that a democracy can't just put a cage around retribution. It must fundamentally transform it from something hardly human, obsessive, bloodthirsty, to something fully human, accepting of reasons, something that protects life rather than threatening it. The Furies are still needed because this is an imperfect world and there will always be crimes to be dealt with, but they're not wanted or needed in their original form. They must become instruments of justice and human welfare. The city is liberated from the scourge of vindictive anger which produces civil strife, in its place, the city gets forward-looking justice. Like modern democracies, the ancient Greek democracy had an anger problem. 
read the historians and you'll see some things that are not at all unfamiliar. Individuals litigating obsessively against people they blame for having wronged them, groups blaming other groups for their lack of power, citizens blaming prominent politicians and other elites for selling out the dearest values of the democracy, other groups blaming foreign visitors or even women for their own political and personal woes. The anger that the Greeks and later the Romans knew all too well was an anger full of fear at one's own human vulnerability. The Roman philosopher Lucretius even says that all political anger is an outgrowth of fear, of the terror of each human baby who comes into the world, he says, helpless and unlike all the other animals, can't do anything on its own to get what it needs. Lucretius sees that as life goes on, vulnerability continues or even increases since the awareness of death hits us hard at some point, making us realize that we're helpless with respect to the most important thing of all. This fear, he says, makes everything worse, leading to political ills to which I'll return. But for now, let's focus on anger. The Greeks and Romans saw a lot of anger all around them. But as classical scholar William Harris shows in his fine book, Restraining Rage, they did not embrace or valorize anger. They did not define manliness in terms of anger. And indeed, as with those furies, they tended to impute it, to, to ascribe it to women, whom they saw as lacking in rationality. However much they felt and expressed anger, they waged a cultural struggle against it, seeing it as destructive of human well-being and later of democratic institutions. The first word of Homer's Iliad is anger, the anger of Achilles that, quote, brought thousandfold pains upon the Achaeans. And the Iliad's hopeful ending requires Achilles to give up his anger and to be reconciled with his enemy Priam as both acknowledge the frailty of human life. I believe the Greeks and the Romans are right. Anger is a poison to democratic politics. And it is all the worse when, as so often, it is fueled by a lurking fear and a sense of helplessness. As a philosopher, I've been working on the, uh, those ideas for some time, first in a book published in 2016, but, but begun well before that, like around 2012, called Anger and Forgiveness, and now in a book that's coming out uh, in the summer called The Monarchy of Fear, investigating the relationship between anger and fear. In my work, I draw not only on the Greeks and Romans, but also on some recent figures, as I will tonight, and I'll conclude that we should resist anger in ourselves and inhibit its role in our political culture. That idea, however, is radical and evokes strong opposition. For anger, with all its admitted ugliness, is a popular emotion. Many people think that it's impossible to care for justice without anger at injustice, and that anger should even be encouraged as part of a transformative process. Many also believe that it's impossible for individuals to stand up for their own self-respect without anger, that someone who reacts to wrongs and insults without anger is spineless and downtrodden. Nor are these ideas confined to the sphere of personal relations. The most popular position in the sphere of criminal justice in the United States today is retributivism, the view that the law ought to punish aggressors in a manner that embodies the spirit of justified anger. And it's also very widely believed that successful challenges against great injustice need anger to make progress. Still, we may persist for a bit in our Aeschylean skepticism, remembering that recent years have seen three noble and successful freedom movements, all conducted in a spirit of non-anger, those of Mohandas Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela. Surely, people who stood up for their own self-respect and that of others, and who did not acquiesce in injustice. So now I'll try to argue that a philosophical analysis of anger can help us support these philosophies of non-anger, showing why anger is fatally flawed from a normative viewpoint, 
at times incoherent, at other times based upon deficient values, and especially poisonous when people use it to deflect attention from real problems that they feel powerless to solve. Anger pollutes democratic politics and is of dubious value in both life and the law. So I'll first present my general view and then show its relevance to thinking well about the struggle for political justice, taking our own ongoing struggle with racism and racial justice as my example, and thereby returning to King. So section one, the roots of anger, rage, ideas of unfairness. So let's now consider that baby whom Lucretius brilliantly described. Babies at birth don't have anger as such because anger requires causal thinking. Someone did something bad to me. Fairly soon, however, as psychologists have been stressing recently, that idea creeps in. Those caretakers are not giving me what I desperately need. They did this to me. It's because of them that I'm cold, wet, and hungry. Experiences of being fed, held, and clothed quickly lead to expectations, expectations to demands. Instinctual self-love makes us value our own survival and comfort, but the self is threatened by others when they don't do what we want and expect. Psychoanalyst Melanie Klein refers to this emotional reaction in infants as persecutory anxiety, since it is indeed fear, but it's coupled with an idea of a vague threat coming from the outside. So I would prefer to call it fear slash anger or even fear slash blame. If we weren't helpless, we would just go get what we need. And I think that's what most of the animals do. But we are, in fact, uh, helpless, and so we have to rely on other people. They don't always give us what we need, and then we lash out blaming them. Blame gives us a strategy. Now I'll enforce my will by raging and making noise. But it also expresses an underlying picture of the world. The world ought to give us what we demand. When people don't do that, they're bad. Protest and blame are positive in a sense. They construct an orderly, purposive world in which I'm an agent making demands. My life is valuable. Things ought to be arranged so that I'm happy and my needs are met. That hasn't happened, so someone must be blamed. But retributive anger all too often infects the thought of blame and often even a punishment the people we blame ought to suffer for what they have done. Psychologist Paul Bloom has shown that retributive thinking appears very early in the lives of infants, even before they begin to use language. Infants express delight when they see the so-called bad person, that is in this case, a puppet who has snatched something from another puppet, beaten with a stick. Bloom calls this an early sense of justice, while I prefer to call it the internal furies that inhabit us all and that are not securely linked to real justice. The infant's idea looks like a version of the lex talionis, an eye for an eye, pain for pain. It's not hard to imagine that this crude idea of proportional payback has an early and perhaps an evolutionary origin. It's a leap to call this an idea of justice and I think that we shouldn't make that leap. Second section, defining anger. Let's now fast forward to human adulthood. People now experience and express not just primitive rage, but full-fledged anger. But what is anger? Philosophers are fond of definitions, which are useful to clear our heads. In this case, helping us eventually separate the potentially promising parts of anger from those that lead to nothing but trouble. And back to the Greeks, let's talk for a bit about Aristotle's definition, since more or less all the definitions of anger in the Western philosophical tradition are modeled on it. And those in Indian traditions, unfortunately the only non-Western traditions known to me, are very similar. According to Aristotle, anger is a response to a significant damage to something or someone that one cares about and a damage that the angry person believes to have been wrongfully inflicted. 
Aristotle adds that although the anger itself is painful, it also contains within itself a pleasant hope for payback or retribution. So we have significant damage pertaining to one's own values or the things one cares about and wrongfulness. Those two elements seem both true and pretty uncontroversial and they have been validated by modern psychological studies. Those parts of anger can go wrong in specific and local ways. We might be wrong about who did the bad thing or how significant it was or whether in fact it was done wrongfully rather than accidentally. But often those two parts are on target. More controversial certainly is the idea that the angry person always wants some type of retribution and that this is a conceptual part of what anger is. Now, in fact, all the Western philosophers who talk about anger do include this wish for retribution as a conceptual element in anger. Still, we need to pause because it's really not obvious. Now, we should understand that the wish for retribution can be a very subtle wish. The angry person doesn't need to wish to go out and take revenge herself. She may simply want the law to punish the wrongdoer or even some type of divine justice, or she may even more subtly simply want the wrongdoer's life to go very badly in the future. Hoping, for example, that that second marriage of your betraying spouse is a dismal failure. <laughs> I think if we do understand the wish in this broad way, Aristotle's right, anger does contain a sort of strike back tendency, and that's what differentiates it from compassionate grieving. Contemporary psychologists who study anger empirically agree with Aristotle in seeing this double movement in it from pain to hope. We should understand, however, that the two parts of anger can come apart. We can feel outrage at the wrongfulness of an act or an unjust state of affairs without wanting payback for the wrong done to us. I'll be arguing that the outrage part is personally and socially valuable when our beliefs are correct. We need to recognize wrongful acts and protest them, expressing our concern for the violation of an important norm. And there's one species of anger, I believe, that is free of the retributive wish. Its entire content is, how outrageous that is, something should be done about that. I call this transition anger because it expresses a protest, but it faces forward, it sort of turns around. It gets to work finding solutions rather than dwelling on the infliction of retrospective pain. Take parents and children. Parents often feel that the children have acted wrongfully and they are outraged. They want to protest the wrong and somehow to hold the child accountable. But usually, at least nowadays, I think, they avoid retributive payback. They rarely think, no, you've got to suffer for what you've done, as if that by, self, by itself was a fitting response. Instead, they ask themselves, what sort of reaction will produce future improvement in the child? Usually, this will not be a proportional payback. It certainly won't obey the lex talionis, an eye for an eye. If their child hits a playmate, parents don't hit their child as if that were what you deserve. Instead, they choose strategies that are firm enough to get the child's attention and that express clearly that and how what the child did was wrong. And then they give positive suggestions for the future, how to do things differently. So loving parents typically have the outrage part of anger without the payback part, where their beloved children are concerned because they love them. This will be a clue to my positive proposal for democratic society where I fear we do not love our fellow citizens. Not all of them, anyway. Retributive wishes, however, are a deep part of human nature, fostered by some parts of the major religions and by many societal cultures, although they have been denounced by religious and social radicals from Jesus and the Buddha to Gandhi. They may have served us well in a pre-social condition, deterring aggression, but the idea that pain is made good or assuaged by pain, though extremely widespread, is a deceptive fiction. Killing the killer does not restore the dead to life. 
although the demand for capital punishment is endorsed by many families of victims as if it did somehow set things to rights. Pain for pain is an easy idea, but it's a false lure creating more pain instead of rectifying the problem. As Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. This wish for payback arises in all kinds of situations. Take divorce. Betrayed spouses often feel entitled to seek punitive divorce settlements and child custody arrangements, as if that somehow were their due, and as if punitive payback somehow restored the balance of power or rescued their damaged dignity. But in real life, the function of payback is usually less benign. Two people become locked in a struggle for pain, focused on the past, and often inflicting great collateral damage on children and on friends and family. In the end, the betrayer may get what's called his comeuppance, but what does that exactly achieve? Typically, it does not improve the litigant's life going forward. By focusing obsessively on the past, she becomes closed to new possibilities, and she often becomes bitter and unpleasant. Retaliation is ugly, as Aeschylus shows us in his portrait of the Furies. What the payback seeker really wants is future happiness and self-respect. Payback by itself never achieves that and it usually makes the world a lot worse for all. But wait a minute, we all agree that wrongful acts, if they're serious enough, should be punished, and punishment is typically painful. Yes, I think we should agree that punishment is often useful, but why and how? We might see punishment in a retributive spirit as payback for what has already happened. That's the attitude I've been criticizing. And it does great social harm, leading to a gruesome pile on the misery strategy as if it really compensated for the damages of crime. But there's a better attitude, more like that of the good parent in my example. We might try to look to the future and produce a better society, using punishment to express the value we attach to human life and safety, to deter other people from committing that crime and we hope to deter that individual from committing another crime or at least incapacitating him. If we think this way, however, trying to improve the future, we probably will have a lot of other thoughts before we get to punishment. Like that good parent, we will think that people don't do wrong nearly as often if they are basically loved and respected, if they have enough to eat, if they get a decent education, if they are healthy, and if they can foresee a future of opportunity. So thinking about crime will lead us in the direction of designing a society in which people have fewer incentives to commit crime. When they do, despite our best efforts, we take that seriously for the sake of the future. There's one more part to Aristotle's definition. He says that anger is always a response not to any old kind of damage, but only to the type that he calls a down ranking. Now, I think this is not true all of the time. I can get angry at wrongs done to others without thinking of them as a down, rank, rank, down ranking of me. Later philosophers actually drop that part of Aristotle's definition for that reason. Because anger can be a response to any wrongful act, not just a status injury. But still, let's hold on to that part of Aristotle's idea, for it does cover surprisingly many cases of anger, as empirical researchers emphasize. The status idea is important because it's the one case, I believe, where payback really gives you what you want. If what you are focused on is not the murder or the theft or the rape itself, but only on the way it has affected your relative status in society, then by pushing the wrongdoer relatively lower, you really do push yourself up relatively higher. And if relative status is the only thing you care about, you needn't be worried that the underlying harms caused by the wrongful act, the murder, the rape, the theft, have not been made good. If you're thinking only about relative status, then 
payback can make perfect sense. Many people do think this way, and that may help explain why payback is so popular and why people do not quickly conclude that it's an empty diversion from the task of fixing the future. But what's actually wrong with the status focus? Focus on relative status was common in ancient Greece. Indeed, it explains Achilles' anger when Agamemnon insults him by taking so-called his woman away. Focus on status was common too at the founding of the United States, as Lynn manuel Miranda's brilliant Hamilton reminds us all. Elaborate codes of honor and status led indeed to constant status anxiety and to many duels responding to purported insults. What's wrong with the obsession with status, and I think the musical shows that really brilliantly, is that life is not all about being in the room where it happens, about relative status. It's about more substantial things, about love, justice, work, family. We all know people today who are obsessed with what other people think of them, who constantly scan social media to see who's been insulting them. Social media certainly encouraged this obsession as people diss each other, count the number of likes some post of theirs has garnered, and so on. As we live more and more in the eyes of others, more and more of our lives come in for ranking, up or down. But isn't this obsession with status a sign of deep insecurity? And doesn't it actually increase insecurity since the person who scans the world for signs of disfavor is sure to find some? Equally important, isn't the obsession with status a diversion from other more important values? Achilles had to learn how bad it was to destroy thousands of Achaean people on account of one insult. Aaron Burr never learned much, it appears, but his example shows us what we forfeit when we do become obsessed with being in the room where it happens. Notice that the obsession with relative status is different from a focus on human dignity or self-respect. Since dignity belongs to every single person, and people are equal in dignity, at least that is how we ought to think and we typically do think, so dignity does not establish a hierarchy. And nobody would be tempted to suppose that inflicting humiliation on someone else would increase my human dignity. So dignity, unlike reputation, is equal and inalienable. So section three. Three errors in anger. So we're now ready to see three ways anger can lead us astray. Number one, what I would call the obvious errors. Anger can be misguided and guide us badly if it's based on wrong information about who did what to whom, about whether the bad act was really done wrongfully rather than just by accident, and also if it's based on a confused sense of importance. Aristotle mentions people who get very angry when someone forgets their name. And this familiar example is a case of overestimating the importance of what the person did. Since we're often hasty when we're angry, these errors occur often. Second way is the status error. We also go wrong, I claim, if we think relative status is hugely important and focus on that to the exclusion of other things. This error, of course, is really a case of mistaking the importance of a particular value, but since it's so common and such a major source of anger, I single it out and give it a separate rubric. And number three, the payback error. Finally, we very often go wrong when we permit deeply ingrained retributive thoughts to take over, making us think that pain wipes out pain, death wipes out murder, and so on. We go wrong because that thought is a kind of irrational, magical thinking, and because it distracts us from the future, which we can change and often should. Next section is called the fourth error in anger, helplessness and the just world. All these errors are common, not least in the political life. We get hold of the wrong story about who did what, or we blame individuals and groups for a large systemic problem that they didn't really cause. We overestimate trivial wrongs and also sometimes underestimate large ones. We obsess about our own relative status 
or that of our group. We think that payback will solve the problems created by the original offense, even though it does not. But there's more. We impute blame often, even when there's no blame to be apportioned. The world is full of accidents. Sometimes a disaster is just a disaster. Sometimes illness and hardship are just illness and hardship. The medical profession cannot keep us completely safe from disease and death, and the wisest and most just social policies will not entirely prevent economic woes arising from natural disasters. But in our monarchical way, like that baby we talked about, we expect the world to be made for us. It gratifies our ego and is in a very deep sense comforting to think that any bad event is someone else's fault. The act of pinning blame and pursuing the bad guy is deeply consoling. It makes us feel control rather than helplessness. Psychologists recently have done a lot of research on people's instinctual views of the way the world works, and they find that people have a deep-rooted need to believe that the world is just. One aspect of what they call the just world hypothesis is a tendency to believe that people who are badly off have caused their own misery by laziness or bad conduct, and we're quite familiar with that one. But another related aspect of this just world belief is the need to believe that when we encounter loss and adversity, it isn't just loss, it's someone's wrongdoing, and we can somehow recoup our loss by punishing the bad guy. Your parent dies in the hospital. It's very human to believe the doctors did it and to deflect one's grief into malpractice litigation. Your marriage falls apart. Well, often there is fault somewhere, but sometimes it can't be easily identified. Things do just fall apart. Still, it's human to fix blame on the bad spouse and try to crush that person with litigation. It makes life look more intelligible, the universe more just. Economic woes are sometimes caused by an identifiable person or person's malfeasance, and sometimes by clearly stupid or unfair policies, but often, too, their cause is obscure and uncertain. We feel bad saying that. It makes the world look messy and ungovernable. So why not pin the blame, as the Greeks did, on groups that are easy to demonize? In the place of their rhetorical category of barbarians, we might focus the blame on immigrants or women entering the workforce, or also, I mean, others might focus it on bankers. The Salem witch trials were once thought to be the result of group hysteria among adolescent girls. But now we know that a preponderant number of the witch blamers were young men entering adulthood, afflicted by the usual woes of an insecure colony in a new world, economic uncertainty, a harsh climate, political instability. How easy then to externalize, to blame the whole thing on witches, usually elderly unpopular women who can easily be targeted and whose death brings a temporary satisfaction to the mind. Our earliest fairy tales often have this structure. Hansel and Gretel wander into the woods to search for food. The problem is hunger compounded by the fact that their parents have to work at menial jobs and have no leisure to take care of the children. But the story tells us that these very real problems are actually unreal and that the real problem is a witch who lives in the woods and turns little children into gingerbread. Red Riding Hood goes to visit her grandmother walking a long distance alone. The real problem in this story seems to be aging and lack of care the family lives far away and grandmother is not doing well. But quickly, the story deflects our attention. The problem is not this difficult human problem at all, requiring a structural solution. It's a single wolf who's broken into grandmother's house. In both stories, when the ugly villain is killed, the world is just fine. Our love of an orderly universe makes these simple fictional solutions tempting. It's hard to wrap our minds around complicated problems, and it's far easier to incinerate the witch than to live with hope in a world that is not made for human delectation. Next section, section five, anger, child of fear. 
Anger is a distinct emotion with distinctive thoughts. It looks manly and important, not at all timorous. Nonetheless, it's an offspring of fear. How so? First, if we were not plagued by great vulnerability, we would probably never get angry. Lucretius imagined the gods as beings who were perfect and complete beyond our world, and he said, they are not enslaved by gratitude, nor are they tainted by anger. If anger is a response to a significant damage inflicted by someone else on you, then a person who's complete, who cannot be damaged, has no room for anger. Judeo-Christian pictures of divine anger imagine God as loving humans and is deeply vulnerable to their misdeeds. Some moral reformers have urged us to become like Lucretius's gods. The Greek Stoics thought that we should learn not to care at all about what they called the goods of fortune, that is, anything that can be damaged by anything outside our own control. Then we would lose fear, and in the bargain, we'd lose anger. Philosopher Richard Sarabji has shown that Gandhi's views were very similar to those of the Stoics. The problem, however, is that in losing fear, we also lose love. The basis of both is a strong attachment to someone or something outside our full control. There's nothing that makes us more vulnerable than loving other people or loving a country. So much can go wrong. In one half year, the Roman philosopher and politician Cicero lost the two things he loved most in the world when his daughter Tullia died in childbirth and the Roman Republic collapsed into tyranny. Even though his friends thought his grief excessive and urged him to be a proper stoic, he told his best friend Atticus that he could not stop grieving. And what's more, he did not think he ought to. Taking the measure of love fully means suffering. So the solution that wipes out both fear and anger with one stroke is not one that we should accept. Keeping love means keeping fear. And though that does not necessarily mean keeping anger, it makes it a lot harder to win the struggle with anger. Fear is not only a necessary precondition for anger, it's also a, an insidious poison to anger feeding the four errors. When we're afraid, we jump to conclusions, lashing out before we thought carefully about the who and the how. When problems are complex and their cause poorly understood, as economic problems tend to be, fear often leads us to pin blame on individuals or on groups conducting witch hunts rather than pausing to figure things out. Fear also feeds obsession with relative status. When people feel bigger than others, they think they can't be destroyed. But when people protect their vulnerable egos by thoughts of status, they can easily be goaded into anger since the world is full of insults and slights. Indeed, Lucretius traces all status competition to fear, arguing that it's a way of soothing ourselves by putting others down, we make ourselves feel big and invulnerable. And fear also feeds the focus on payback, since vulnerable people think that getting back at wrongdoers or even obliterating them is a way of reestablishing lost control and dignity. Lucretius even traces all wars to fear. Feeling insecure, he says, we rage against what threatens us and seek to obliterate it. He omits the obvious possibility that war may be caused by a reasonable reaction to a genuine threat to our safety and our values. So I think we should not accept his analysis fully. I'm not a pacifist, nor were my primary heroes of non-anger, Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela. Gandhi, I think, made a large mistake by endorsing total pacifism, uh, and of course urging not to make armed resistance to Hitler. But even just wars, such as I believe the Second World War to have been, are often more marred by zeal for the blood of the aggressor. And one could certainly argue that episodes such as the bombing of Dresden were motivated by payback rather than sound policy. Great leaders understand that we need to retain and fortify the spirit of determined protest against wrongdoing 
without comforting ourselves with retributive thinking. The brilliant speech in which Winston Churchill said, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, refers to danger, to struggle, and to a willingness to accept great pain in order to preserve democratic values. It is conspicuous for its utter lack of retributivism. Churchill does not say that paying back the Nazis will remove the threat to freedom. Freedom is beautiful, and we must always be prepared to suffer for it, but we must focus on defending what we love rather than disgorging our venom on the land, as Aeschylus put it. Churchill's speech is of a piece with the best allied aims to rebuild Germany post-war, and we can now see the wisdom of that course as Germany is among our most valuable allies, and perhaps we might add a model of democratic rationality in this world. Finally, helplessness and the fear that goes with it lead to the reflex in which we pin blame on someone in order to feel less buffeted by fortune and more in control. Even a long and difficult struggle, a protracted malpractice litigation, a divorce suit lasting many years is often psychologically preferable to accepting loss. So sixth and last section, protests without payback. So what's the alternative? We can keep the spirit of determined protest against injustice while letting go of the empty fantasy of payback. This forward-looking strategy includes protesting wrongdoing wherever it occurs, but not imputing wrongdoing where there is instead the murky thicket of the global economy to manage, outsourcing and automation to reconcile with our citizens' welfare, never seizing hold of blame as a substitute for a feeling of powerlessness, but also not yielding to despair. Even when we're confident in imputing wrongdoing to an individual or group, we can still firmly refuse payback but look to the future with hope, choosing strategies designed to make things better rather than to inflict the maximum pain. So to conclude, I want to study closely just one example of protest without payback, and that is the ideas of Martin Luther King Jr., who contributed so much to our society's ongoing struggle with racism and its search for justice. King always said that anger had a limited usefulness in the sense that it brought people to his protest movement rather than sitting in despair. But once they got there, he said, the anger had to be purified and channelized, two words that he frequently used. And what he meant was that people must give up the payback wish and yet keep the spirit of justified protest. Instead of retribution, they need hope and they need faith in the possibility of justice. In an essay written in 1959, he says that the struggle for integration will continue to encounter obstacles and that these obstacles can be met in two very different ways. And I'll quote, one is the development of a wholesome social organization to resist with effective firm measures any efforts to impede progress. The other is a confused anger motivated drive to strike back violently to inflict damage. Primarily, it seeks to cause injury, to retaliate for wrongful suffering. It is punitive, not radical or constructive. King, of course, was characterizing not just a deep-seated human tendency, but the actual ideas and sentiments of Malcolm X as he understood them. King insisted constantly that his approach did not mean acquiescing in injustice. There's still an urgent demand there's still a protest against unjust conditions in which the protester takes great risks with his or her body in what King called direct action. Still, the protester's focus must turn to the future that all must work to create together with hope and faith in the possibility of justice. King, in short, favors and exemplifies what I've called transition anger, the protest part of anger without the payback. To see this better, let me try to study the sequence of emotions in the famous I have a dream speech. So King begins, at least, with what looks like a summons to anger. 
He points to the wrongful injuries of racism, which have failed to fulfill the nation's implicit promises of equality. 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, he says, quote, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination, end quote. The next move King makes is significant. Instead of demonizing white Americans, he calmly compares them to people who have defaulted on a financial obligation. Quote, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Now this begins the shift to what I've called transition anger, for it makes us think ahead in non-retributive ways. So the essential question now is not how whites can be humiliated, but how can the debt be paid? And in the financial metaphor, the thought of destroying the debtor is not likely to be central. The future now takes over as King focuses on a time in which all may join together in pursuing justice and honoring obligations. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So no mention again of torment or payback, only of determination to ensure the protection of civil rights at last. King reminds his audience that the moment is urgent. There's a danger of rage spilling over, but he repudiates that in advance. Quote, in the process of gaining a rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force by soul force. The soul force was a big Gandhi term that he's quoting here. So the payback is reconceived as the future vindication of civil rights, a process that unites black and white in a quest for freedom and justice. Everyone benefits, he says, as many white people already recognize, quote, their freedom is inextricably bound up with our freedom. King then repudiates despair and the abandonment of effort and it's at this point that the most famous part of the speech, the I have a dream part, takes flight. And of course, this dream is not one of retributive punishment. It's not taken from the book of Revelation, but a prophetic dream of equality, liberty, and brotherhood. In pointed terms, King invites the African-American members of his audience to imagine brotherhood even with their former tormentors. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Now, there is indeed outrage in King's speech, and the outrage summons up a vision of rectification, which might easily have taken a retributive form, but King gets busy right away reshaping retributivism into work and hope for how sanely and really could injustice be made good by retributive payback. The oppressor's pain and lowering do not make the afflicted free. Only an intelligent, determined, and imaginative effort toward justice can do that. It might seem strange to compare King to Aeschylus, though it's not really so strange at all given King's vast learning in literature and philosophy. He's basically saying the same thing. Democracy must give up 
the empty and destructive thought of retributive payback and move toward a future of legal justice and human well-being. King's opponents portrayed his stance as weak. Malcolm X said sardonically that it was like some coffee that has had so much milk poured into it that it has turned white and cold and doesn't even taste like coffee anymore. But that was wrong. King's stance is strong, not weak. He resists one of the most powerful of human impulses, the retributive, for the sake of the future. One of the trickiest problems in politics is to persist in a determined search for solutions without letting fear deflect us onto the track of anger's errors. The idea that Aeschylus and King share is that democratic citizens should face with courage the problems and yes, the outrageous injustices that we encounter in political and social life. Lashing out in anger and fear does not solve these problems. Instead, it leads, as it did in both Athens and Rome, to a spiral of retributive violence. Lucretius tells a grim tale of human anger and fear gone wild. He imagines a world not unlike his own in Republican Rome, in which insecurity leads to more and more acts of aggression, which, of course, don't quiet the insecurity. At the time when he wrote, the Roman Republic was imploding, and insecurity mounting everywhere would shortly give way to tyranny. In an effort to quiet fear, then, he imagines people get more and more aggressive until they think up a bright new idea, a new way to inflict maximum damage on their enemies. Namely, they put wild beasts to work in the military. I'll quote a bit of this. They even tried out bulls in the service of war. They practiced letting wild boars loose against their enemies. They even used fierce lions as an advance guard equipped with a special force of armed and ferocious trainers to hold them in check and keep them in harness. It was no use. The lions, hot with blood, broke ranks wildly, trampled the troops, tossing their manes, and goes on and on in a very horrifying way. In a poetic tour de force, Lucretius imagines the carnage that the animals now unleash. Then he steps back. Did this really happen, he asks. Well, maybe it happened in some other world out in space. And what, he says, did these fictional people really want to accomplish? To inflict great pain on the enemy, even if it meant that they would perish themselves. Lucretius's point is that our retributive emotions are those wild beasts. People may think anger powerful, but it always gets out of hand and turns back on us. And yet worse, half the time, people don't really care. They're so deeply sunk in payback fantasies that they prefer to accomplish nothing so long as they make those people suffer. His grim science fiction fantasy reminds us that we'll always defeat ourselves so long as we let ourselves be governed by fear, anger, and the politics of blame. There is a better alternative Aeschylus knew it, and King both knew and lived it. Making a future of justice and well-being is really hard. It requires self-examination, personal risk, searching critical arguments, empirical facts, and uncertain initiatives to make common cause with our opponents in a spirit of hope and what we might call rational faith. It's a difficult goal but I think not impossible, and it is that goal that I'm recommending for both individuals and democratic institutions. Let's try as best we can to pursue it. Thanks. Good evening, friends. My name is Matt Hickey. I've got the pleasure of uh, serving as moderator this evening. We have a special opportunity to engage with an extraordinarily talented and, and winsome guest, and so I hope that 
Professor Nussbaum's remarks may have stimulated some questions in you, and I would invite you even now to begin to come forward. We'll have microphones on both sides of the podium. For those of you that may be joining us by live stream, we are wired, and we can, in fact, read some of those comments into the conversation as well. And I'd love it if students would, would ask the first two. So I think I We have one almost ready to go. have a student, so great. <laughs> Almost, hi, Corey. And say your you? name and what your subject is. Yes, let me just reinforce that. If you could give us your name and your affiliation, if you're willing to keep your questions brief so yeah. we can have a broad base of conversations. And last but not least, the most difficult part, <laughs> if you could frame your questions in the form of a question, it yeah. would be very much yeah. appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not a student. but. Oh. I do have well, a question. <laughs> um, I'm wondering and your if name I'm. And your affiliation. Oh, yeah, sorry. My name is Corey Wong, and I work at CSU. I lead a women and gender initiative on campus. Oh, great. And teach in women's studies and ethnic studies. So, my question is um, I understand the notion of an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. So, in terms of lashing out as a form of payback, that that can be really harmful and not productive. But I'm wondering about where justice comes in instead of payback as more like payment. Because thinking towards a future, the, the shift towards a transformative future opportunity, that to me sounds more like equality or freedom, where everyone has the opportunity for freedom and equality. But when wrongs are committed then, it, I'm wondering if I'm confused because I have a sense of something like a false dichotomy, like don't lash out and payback, I can agree. But then what else can we do for justice? So like holding people accountable yeah, yeah. Or, or some other middle ground where it's not just we're looking to the future where everybody has freedom and equality. Okay, well the first thing, of course, is to start ex ante by trying to create a society in people in which people are treated decently from the get-go and right. they have love, nutrition, education. I think universal pre-K education is one of the most important things mm -hmm. that we could do. And then, you know, sure, there will eventually be some crime, but we don't wait for the crime to take place and then whop the person. Now, if the crime does indeed take place, sure, I think we have to think about punishment uh, in order to preserve accountability. Accountability is a crucial ingredient of political trust, mm -hmm. political cooperation. And so, um, but I think the nature and spirit of the punishment should be thought of in several ways. One would be, of course, incapacitation, just keeping the wrongdoer away from harming other people. Then there's deterrence. There's specific deterrence, meaning that that person now will be deterred from wronging again, or at least we hope so. But also general deterrence, it will give a signal that will send a signal to other people who would be deterred from committing that same crime. Reform is another thing we must think about. You've sort of given up on that, but we shouldn't give up on it. And I think it's very striking that in drug context, we thought about re retribution only when it was crack cocaine and malefactors were imagined as mostly black. Now that we're dealing with the opiate addictions, which were the malefact, so-called malefact, people uh, are regarded as mostly white, and therefore people are suddenly talking about treatment and reform, but they should have been talking about that all along instead of thinking in this punitive way. And the final thing we need to think about is the expressive. That is where the act is really a wrongful act, and I don't think the drug use is in that category. Then, um, because it doesn't harm anyone but the, the, the person. But um, then we would try to express by the punishments we mete out the sense of what our values are. So that means, you know, we do want to have some penalties. Let me just talk about sexual harassment in the university. That is an eminently deterrable crime. And I think since my own day where it was totally ubiquitous to today where, at least in the university context, it's much less common. Um, certainly it's more common in other places like in Hollywood. Um, but in, in the university, much less common. And I think the people who are not deterred are usually ones who have deep-rooted uh, problem of some sort. 
you know, then the deterrent function is extremely important, but also the expressive function. It tells everyone we're taking women's bodily integrity and their ability to be treated with dignity very, very seriously. So those are all very important things. Now, in the context of revolutionary or transitional justice, we may have additional questions like if the old regime was thoroughly rotten and was committing just horrible crimes, the very nature of the regime was horrible, what do we do then? And I think the two things that are really important in the case of regime transition are number one, uh, some sort of truth, because only that brings accountability, and also some sort of forward moving way of dealing with the problem, which in involves some kind of reconciliation. Now, in the case of South Africa, Mandela felt, and so did others, that having actual criminal trials would be a mistake because it wouldn't produce truth. These people would lawyer up and they would be rich and they would get high-powered lawyers. So he thought that the amnesty with truth was the best way of getting those two desiderata. In other places, you may want criminal trials, and I think that often is something you do want. But the truth part is really, really important. So I think, for example, in Northern Ireland, where they tried to leap ahead to reconciliation without going through truth, it's been a big mistake, because we know that there is all this stuff that's sealed in this lock archive in Boston College, and what Jerry Adams did in the kidnapping of Jean McConville is known, it's in that archive, but no one can see it until everyone involved is dead. And this is terrible. No political trust. I mean, people trust Michael McGinnis because they know exactly what murders he committed. And you know, maybe they were worse than what Jerry Adams did, but, but, but people know. Uh, but with Jerry Adams, they just don't know whether he killed her or not killed her. So uh, truth is really, really important if you're going to have reconciliation. So anyway, I, yeah, so I do insist a lot on accountability. But see, I think it is in the end the same as with a child. You don't want to just laugh or smile at a child's wrongdoing. You want them to know that what they did was wrong and you want some kind of accountability, but then you choose the strategy that's best calibrated for that situation and that individual's future. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's another question coming up. May I follow up by saying, in addition to like a retribution model focusing on individual criminal acts or harms, I'm wondering if another form of justice that goes hand in hand with a kind of accountability on the level of a social system, like when we're referring to the civil rights movement, of something along the lines more like truth, accountability, and reparations as a kind of yeah. repayment, not pay back to those who were causing so much harm right. and maintain that system, but instead some acknowledgement in that uh, form I as justice. I think reparations can often be part of producing a future of trust, but myself, I mean, of course, there's a huge debate on this, I'm sure you know. The function of rep reparations seems to me best understood in expressive, forward-looking terms. Mm -hmm. After all, it's not the people who really suffered who are getting it, and it's not the people who really did the wrong who are giving it, but it's a way of expressing our s shared sense of the bad that was done and our determination to move forward into a future of greater justice, and I think that's the main purpose. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Chris. I'm a first year chemistry grad student here. And first of all, thank you for a wonderful speech. I'm very convinced that a restorative justice is a more effective way to create a better future. But I was wondering, um, you seem to imply that the punitive justice system was largely, if not entirely, based in anger. And I was wondering, is there actually any evidence that it works as a deterrent? Um, or is there no oh. evidence at all? Well, okay, so first of all, I'm not objecting to punishment. So when you say the punitive system, mm -hmm. that includes both retributive punishment and deterrent punishment, which I approve mm -hmm. of. And, and so we don't want to say I'm against the punitive system. But no, I think retributive punishment is really, by definition, punishment in which the law, now of course the legal actors themselves are not supposed to be angry, they're supposed to be measured, but the system itself is understood to embody the spirit, spirit of justified anger. So when you get 
from the personal to the social and you deal with sophisticated retributivists like Herbert Morris or Michael Moore, they'll of course never say, oh, the juror should be angry, but they will instead say the system embodies the kind of proportionality that's characteristic of just retributive punishment. So I just think that's the wrong idea about punishment. I think actually punishment itself. So there's this big debate in philosophy called the justification of punishment. But I think the debate should be a much broader debate about how we prevent, and then if we can't entirely do that, deal with the problem of wrongdoing and harm. Uh, I think if we get to the point of using punishment, we, that's a confession of failure in a society. We should have done better, and people should not have had the incentive to commit crimes. And you know, if the only malefactors we were left with were psychopaths, then I think we would feel we'd done a pretty good job. I actually do think that with sexual harassment in universities, we're almost at that point where you, if you study the malefactors who come forward in my profession, they are people with a deep-rooted uh, psychiatric uh, problem. So that's, that's a, it's bad for the people who suffer from that, but it's good for the system. So, um, so anyway, that's what I think about punishment, that it should be the, the last thing after we've tried out other things, as I think it usually is for parents. Does sure. that help answer the question? I, I mean, that was only part answer. of the question, but what, um, what other part have I not answered? I, I was, it seems that those um, who argue in favor of, for example, with um, the crack cocaine epidemic, that those who argue in favor of, say, long jail sentences argue that it is a deterrent to this negative social behavior. Is it actually deterrent? Is there any evidence that supports it's oh. a deterrent? Well, once you move under the ground of deterrence, then you ought to care about empirical facts. Yeah. Most of the people that you're talking about have not cared at all about empirical facts. <laughs> there is absolutely no reason to think that mass incarceration, well, I think by now, the, so the slogan, tough on crime, is thank God, being replaced by the slogan, smart on crime, which means let's pay attention mm -hmm. to empirical evidence. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not only that it's terribly ineffectual, but it also is so expensive. It costs $55,000 a year to keep a prisoner locked mm -hmm. up. And it's getting more and more all the time because guess what? With these long sentences, the prisoners are getting older, they need more health care, and we're paying for all mm -hmm. that. Uh, so uh, people are waking up for one reason or another. Maybe it's just the cost efficiency, but for whatever reason, they're realizing that mass incarceration is a ridiculous strategy. So, you know, if you study the whole issue, and you would have to do it comparatively, looking at European prisons, which have always been quite different, allowing ample family time, work release, and other things, mm -hmm. then you would come to the conclusion pretty quickly that uh, our system is just one of the least efficient systems that could possibly be imagined. All righty, thank you very much. Uh, oops. Okay, I'm Silvia Canetto and I'm a faculty in psychology. Some of the early examples that you gave in your narrative attached deprivation to malfeasance, like you talked about the example of the child being wet, hungry, and uh, cold. No, that's not about malfeasance. That's about but, how we're born. But, need, but need, needs in some ways lead to transgression. No, but, but could, can I just uh, clarify finish. what I said? I said that all human infants are helpless about being wet, hungry, and cold, and they tend to lash out against others because they kind of had this idea that the world ought to do, give them what they want. And I said that that psychological tendency, which seems to be very early, according to Bloom, is the root of much later problems of anger that adults get into. But th there seemed to be a thread in your um, presentation about if you take care of deprivation or need, that you'll reduce transgression of various sorts. And going back to your example of sexual well, harassment, you can see that sexual harassment, the worst of it actually happens to people who have no particular deprivation of needs. In fact, they are some of the most privileged among the members of their society. And that privilege in many ways creates the transgression. 
So I wonder for you to think about you know, through those I, lenses. I, and in I many ways, the people care. who get caught are the people who maybe have the, the, the deprivation, but the people who have the most means I, are the I people who can think continue you're to transgress. understanding what I mean. I mean that if all children were treated the way that you or I would want to treat our beloved children, bringing them up to be responsible adults, which would include nutrition, health care, education, employment opportunities, but I would hope it would include firm learning about the limits of other people's uh, b boundaries and all the things that parents teach their children. Well, I mean, the p these malefactors who act out out of a sense of omnipotence and narcissism, that's the result of some very bad failing in their upbringing. Uh, I don't necessarily want to blame everything on parents. It's very likely the surrounding peer culture as well and the surrounding, you know, even class culture. But it's certainly that they're border, I mean, they're not, uh, those particular ones we're talking about are not psychotic, but they sure are narcissistic. They have personality disorders that no, if I had a child with that personality disorder, uh, I would be very worried about whether I had done all I could do. That's all I could say. Now, of course, as I say, parents can't do everything. We have a lot right. of bad... I think that is more than the psychology of this phenomenon, that there is there are structural factors, whatever the childhood well, might have been, sure, to make it possible. Sure, that's why I say parents can't do everything. Right. But in growing up, we can influence all the factors that turn somebody into a narcissist. Mm -hmm. That I do believe. We have five minutes, folks. So okay. We can into five minutes. So I'll be quick. This is more of an um, academic oriented question because I hear a lot of strains of Seneca's De Ira in what you're saying about the rational, you know, cognitive approaches to anger, and I was wondering how Seneca fits into your conclusions here. And then also looking at, say, you know, Aristotle has a twofold definition. One is the physiological, and one is the intellectual. And can you speak maybe a little bit to you? Gave very much the the rational again, the cognitive arguments against anger, but perhaps how we can fortify ourselves against those immediate physiological overwhelming sensations. Okay, first of all, my view is that all emotions have a very profound cognitive dimension. Now, my own view, which I developed in Upheavals of Thought, is a particularly strong version of a cognitivist account of emotion in that I hold that no particular determinate feeling state or physiological state is even necessary for an emotion such as fear or anger or compassion. And the reasons that I would hold this are twofold. One is variability. I mean, some people uh, experience anger in connection with headache and others experience this boiling feeling. Uh, also variability over time. So, you know, as you're grieving, your feelings wax and wane, but the grief is constant. But also, the, a lot of times, these emotions are just not conscious at all. The non-conscious fear of death is in every person in this room all the time, motivating many actions, such as not walking out in front of cars that are good, but uh, also perhaps some that are not so good. But uh, anyway, you know, if you, fear is the most obvious candidate for some sort of physiological feeling account, that it's a trembling. But even that one, which is, at least you can at least imagine how you might define fear that way. I mean, you can't imagine what the feeling would be with compassion or with, I think, with anger. But, uh, but anyway, it just doesn't uh, work when we think about the non-conscious fears that we always have. And we, we have many non-conscious beliefs, not just emotion beliefs. I have a non-conscious belief that if I lean against a solid object, my arm won't go through it. I have a belief that if I drop my pen, it will fall on the floor. And I don't think about that consciously. So a great part of our beliefs about the world are non-conscious. But the ones that ground the emotions are among those, I think, much of the time. Now, OK, so then the view of Seneca is very close to my view, because he does, I mean, I don't know what interpretation you're taking, but I think the best interpretation of Seneca is that he is really like the original Greek Stoics, and he thinks the cognitive elements are the only ones that are really necessary. The physiological ones come and go, and so on and so on. Um, so my view of what the emotions are, I call in the book Neo-Stoic, because it's an attempt to refurbish and correct 
I mean, I have to correct it because they think it's a judgment, and I think to explain the emotions of non-human animals, we need to make it a sort of value-laden perception instead. So there are many corrections that need to be made, but basically it's a good place to start. Now, you say Aristotle has two definitions. I think actually Aristotle has just one, namely in the rhetoric, where he combines pain or pleasure with the cognitive element. Now, myself, I'm not sure what that really means because I think people assume that that means there are two separate components. There's like the thought and then there's the, the kind of the feeling of pleasure or pain. But we have to remember that Greeks usually didn't think of pleasure as a feeling. They thought of it as an intentional attitude of, that could vary quite a lot depending on what its object was. And I think Aristotle clearly thinks that, you know. He, he doesn't think that pleasure is a single thing. He thinks it supervenes upon actions and so So anyway, once you get into the, the, the thicket of that, you end up thinking that it's more cognitive even than one would think. And uh, there, of course, there is uh, maybe what you have in mind is the one passage where he says, uh, he talks about the boiling of blood around the heart. But remember, he doesn't say that in his own voice. He says some people say that anger is a boiling of blood around the heart. He never uh, endorses such a physiological reduction, and I'm sure he never would. For, for Because more than any other ancient philosopher, I think he was very aware of these problems of multiple realizability. What I mean by that is this is something that my dear friend Hilary Putnam and I wrote an article on, um, saying that, that the fact is that most of our mental states, although they're ultimately realized in matter of some sort, they're multiply realizable. And that Aristotle understood that, and he understood that this is true even of simple geometrical law. So why is it that if you want to talk about how and why a sphere with radius r will go through a hoop of radius slightly greater than r, but a cube of side 2r will not go through that. You don't explain it using the ultimate matter. It doesn't really matter whether the sphere is made of bronze or of marble and the hoop, whether it's of wood or of tin or whatever. You use the laws of geometry to explain that. And it's because they offer the most pertinent and e economical level of explanation. So I think, too, that this is the correct attitude in philosophy of mind, that most, I mean, all the mental states we care about, of course, I think they're physical. How would they not? I don't believe that there are ghostly entities or Cartesian um, disembodied things. But I do think that they're so multiply realizable, and even in the brain, that, we, that the pertinent explanations would be sought on the level of form rather than on the level of ultimate matter. And I believe that Aristotle thought, about, thought that about all substances, but certainly about the emotions, too. Right. Thank you. Right. Friends, I'm reluctant to derail a rich conversation, but I'm afraid that I must. We have a number of other events on Professor Nussbaum's itinerary before the day is done. So I'm going to ask you to join me in saying thank you one more time, if you will.